um, is going to lead us and guide us for today. So message number three, the relationship between faith and healing. I went through the entire book of Mark. I looked at every verse. I just broke it down into 20 things, 20 different times in the book of Mark where uh, we see a healing. And the book of Mark was just the, the shortest one, which is why I selected. Okay. Now, I just want to remind you, when my mother passed away last year, she left a will. If you want to know what was on her heart, you read the will. When you look at the New Testament, we see the heart of God. All you have to do is just read the New Testament. Testament is like the will of God. And Jesus was perfect theology. Jesus said, I haven't come to do my will. I've come to do the will of my Father in heaven. So when we look at the life of Jesus, we see in his life, in his teachings, the perfect will of God being manifested, being displayed. Jesus is perfect theology. So I'm a, you know, I'm a scripture guy. Unfortunately for the Pharisees back then, and even for us today, we wrestle with this difficulty of forming human theology based on a lack of experience, based on failed experiences, failures in our life. And it's not based on the word. So I'm just challenging you. We're going to look at only what the word says and formulate our thinking based upon the word. We're talking about such an important subject today, which is faith. All right. So look at this overview of Mark. I want you to turn to Mark chapter one. And we're going to look at a couple. We'll look at three stories just to illustrate these three categories of what I've come up with in the book of Mark. So relationship between faith and healing. I've divided all 20 of the healing sections in Mark into three categories. And here they are. There were some categories when no faith was mentioned at all. Nothing at all. Faith was not mentioned. And a lot of times in those places, Jesus initiated to do a healing without anybody even asking. Okay. We'll get to Mark chapter one here in a moment. There were other examples where you kind of could assume that faith was implied because the person came to Jesus and they asked him, would you, would you heal me? So, you know, the implication is that there's faith involved, though it wasn't specifically mentioned in scripture. And the final case is where faith specifically, like the word faith is mentioned in the verse. So I broke all of these down. And if you see at the very bottom, I think I put that on the bottom of yours. Um, my conclusion was, in many cases throughout the book of Mark, faith played an important role. In six out of 20 of the cases in the whole book, there was no mention of personal faith. So in other words, Jesus initiated a healing as a sovereign act of God. And that still happens today. Jesus can do whatever he wants. You could be laying in a hospital, nobody prays, nobody has faith, and I've still seen people get healed because Jesus always has faith and he can do whatever he wants. All right. Six out of 20 times of faith was implied to some degree. So it's kind of like it was an act of compassion based upon a request, based upon somebody coming to Jesus and begging him, please heal me of this leprosy or please, you know, I, I want to see I'm blind. I want to see. And then eight out of the 20 times faith, the word faith is specifically mentioned in the context. And so there's a sovereign response to personal faith. And that is something that Jesus always prioritizes. Do you remember in Hebrews chapter 11, verse one? Okay. Without faith, you guys finish it. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Which means God is pleased by faith. Your personal faith. He's pleased by personal. He responds to personal faith. Okay. Now. Let's take a look at just one example of each of these three. And since there are four, uh, five, six, and seven here, Mark chapter one, two, and three, we can run through these real quick. All right. And then on the back, your handout's different than mine. On the back is some overviewing, overarching principles. All right. So Mark chapter one, uh, this one is in verse 40 is labeled Jesus cleanses a leper. Let's read the story. And a leper came to him, imploring Jesus, and kneeled before him and said, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, or some versions might say compassion or mercy, he stretched out his hand and said to him, I will, I am willing, be clean. Do you remember when um, 
Jesus met the guy with the thousands of demons in him in the graveyard. And the demons begged Jesus, please don't send us to hell early. Just send us to the pigs. It says in that instance, Jesus was moved with compassion. He would, they begged him, have mercy on us. And Jesus had mercy on demons and gave them what they wanted. If Jesus would have mercy on demons, how much more would he have pity and compassion on his children? Think about that. All right. So many times in scripture, we see that Jesus is moved with compassion to do what he does. And that is certainly one of the ways that we can appeal to him today, even because Jesus is saying yesterday, today, today and forever is to appeal to that mercy, to appeal to that compassion. And I want you to just look at verse 40 again. If you are willing, you can make me clean. So there's two components to this request. There is, you can make me clean. Did this man, how confident was this man that Jesus could heal him? Between zero and a hundred. Hundred, right? Hundred. Now, here's the second part of faith. Faith is not believing that God can. Faith is believing that God can and will. Now think about this for your salvation, all right? It is totally different to believe. I'm sitting out, I'm in Billy Graham's huge stadium. Billy Graham is preaching. I'm sitting in the stadium and I hear him preaching about salvation. And I come to the belief that God can save the sinner. But that is completely different than can God save me, all right? So it's a, personal, it's a personalized thing. If you are willing, you can make me clean. What did the man doubt? Jesus' willingness. That's where most Christians get tripped up. And oftentimes, that's the hardest part. Many of us believe that God can do something, that God is more than powerful. The problem is, is he willing to do it for me? Now, unfortunately, we have developed, all of us are guilty of this, I'm guilty of this. We have developed very bad theology sometimes. And that theology, that human thinking, Sometimes when we step out, if I was to step out and pray for a hundred people and not one of them come to Christ, I preached to a hundred people, shared the gospel with a hundred people, not one of them made a decision for Jesus, I might very well conclude that God's desire is not for anyone to be saved. But we know in scripture, God desires all to be saved and all to come to a place of repentance. So sometimes we can form our theology based on our lack of experience or our failure and not on the word of God. So I'm really going to, I'm going to challenge you today. You'll see what's coming. Trust me. <laughs> um, so two components, willing and able. Um, and Jesus said sternly, uh, okay, wait a second. Verse 42, I am willing. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him, sternly charged him. Say nothing to anyone. Go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing the, the, what Moses commanded as proof to them. But the man went out and began to talk freely about it and he spread the news everywhere so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. Here's my question for you. Do you believe that Jesus knew what this man was gonna do before he healed him? Okay, if you believe that, this is another component. Jesus knew his ministry would be hindered by healing this man, and yet he still did it. Not only does he have compassion even on demons at times, how much more his children, but he knew his whole ministry would have to change just healing this one person. He's like, ah, I'm not going to be able to go into any towns from this point forward. I have to stay out in the wilderness. And he still had compassion to heal this man. All right? That's powerful. Um, let me give you an example here to illustrate these two components. I really want to challenge your faith is God can and God will. What if, a, what if we had a visitor today and it, he was a millionaire just, and he had a briefcase with him. We didn't even know. He came up front. He said, God's really laid on my heart. I've got a briefcase full of money. I want to give $1,000 to two people in this room. And he opens a briefcase. He says, I, he's got the money. I mean, we know he can do it. How confident would you be? He's going to randomly put everybody's name in the hat. How confident would you be that you would be one of the two people that would get $1,000 walking out the door from church today? I mean, one out of 2%, right? Or whatever it is. One out of 50. One out of 40. 
All right, but what if he came up and he said, I've got more than enough money and God's laid on my heart and I want to give $1,000 to every person here today. How confident would you be? 100%, right? He can and it's his will and he's going to, you know, he's willing to do that to every person. So it makes a big difference that he was willing to do something for all who reached out rather than just some. But we've been told, we've been conditioned that God only heals some and not all. All right. Let's look at Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two. This is so the first one, um, the first example that we just looked at. Faith is kind of implied because this leper came imploring Jesus. I think it took faith to come to him. And he had a he had a measure of faith. But I don't think it was the fullness of faith because he didn't know Jesus will. He believed that Jesus had the power, but he didn't know if Jesus was willing to heal. All right. So that was implied faith. This next example, if you'll see on your chart, faith is going to be specifically mentioned. Here's the story. Jesus is in town. He's preaching. It's packed. Remember, the house is packed and there's four men carrying a paralytic and they, they couldn't get in. Remember, they had to drop him down through the roof. And in verse four, Mark chapter two, verse four. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above, made an opening and let him down uh, the paralytic on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. All right. And there's the Pharisees there. They said, who is this that can forgive sins? And Jesus said, so that you will know in the invisible realm that I am able to forgive sins. I'll, I'll prove it in the physical realm with a healing. So you see how the miracle in the physical realm was proof that spiritually Jesus had the power to forgive sins. And he says, rise, take up your mat, your bed and walk. And he's able to do that now. Who do you think had faith? Do you think it was the four men and not the paralytic? Or do you think it was the four men and the paralytic was like, you need to get me to Jesus. I got faith. We can just get to Jesus. Do you think it was all of them? It was more than one because it said them, their faith, plural. So it was either four people had faith, at least two people had faith, four people, maybe all five. But Jesus responded to their faith. It's specifically mentioned in this particular passage. And he responds with the healing uh, that's intimately tied to the forgiveness of sins as well. And I think I always find it interesting that we have the, <laughs> we claim to, we claim to believe that God has done something for us and will one day take us to a place we've never seen. And yet we don't have faith to believe for physical things that are of much lower level. Do you have, does that ever like, I, I believe that Jesus has forgiven me all, of all my sin, but I don't have faith to believe in, in something of a lower, more earthly healing nature. I don't know if that makes sense. So this was proof, this healing was proof that Jesus is who he said he is, can do what he said he could do, and has done what he promised in the spiritual realm. All right. Uh, Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it's impossible to please God. Um, and do you rem no, that was Hebrews 11, 1. Do you remember 11, 6 says, and faith is being sure of what we hope for. And my, I memorized the NIV and certain of what we cannot see. So sure and certain is not, uh, maybe it's not 50%. Sure and certain is confidence, hundred percent confidence. I think it goes back to those two aspects, both his ability and his willingness. All right. Mark chapter three, I just wanted to touch three brief stories. This one is an example where no faith is mentioned at all. The guy doesn't even ask. Jesus is in the synagogue. There's a man with a withered hand. This is Mark chapter three, verse one. Everybody's watching Jesus. He obviously has reasons why he initiated a healing here. Um, they were watching to accuse him. He calls the man with the withered hand to come. Uh, and then he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save life or kill? But everybody was silent. And he looked at them with anger. He was grieved at the hardness of their heart. And he said, stretch out your hand. And as he stretched it out, his hand was restored. So the man, there's no, there's no mention of faith 
of the man. There's no mention of faith of the disciples bringing him and saying, hey, Jesus can heal you. Just come to Jesus. Well, there's no mention of faith whatsoever. But yet in his sovereignty, Jesus took the initiative to heal the man. And he does that today, too. I believe he does that today, too. Even though it got him into big trouble because the Pharisees began to go out and plot his death, if you keep reading. So I don't know. I don't know if you're I was kind of curious. I haven't really come up to with a uh, an answer to this. But what reasons did Jesus have to initiate this healing, especially if it got him in big trouble? I think it was just maybe to overturn the poor thinking of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, you know. So. All right. Now flip over your. Flip over your sheet, okay? We're gonna go through just a couple lessons and I'll say a few things here. I mean, I, I did a lot of work in preparation for this to give you a resource that you can hold on to. And I, I'm a pretty logical thinker. Let's just go through a couple true false lessons. Um, true or false? This is number one. I already gave you the answer. <laughs> Jesus healed a lot of people during his three year ministry, right? True. We know that from scripture. Number two, on multiple occasions, Jesus healed everyone. All, all people, thousands, hundreds in that environment. Okay. And I listed some scripture references. Number three, Jesus sometimes sovereignly initiated healing without being asked. That's certainly true. We just read that. Number four, Jesus sometimes passed by those who needed healing without offering to pray for them. We know that's true. Do you remember... Um, the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, Jesus goes, he's on a mission, he goes to the pool, all the invalids, the paralyzed, the sick, everybody's around the pool, there might have been a couple hundred people, he goes to one person and he initiates a healing with one person. So there are times where Jesus passed by sick people without initiating to heal. But, but, Here's the amazing thing in scripture that we just, it's so hard for our human minds to hold on to this. If we could grasp this with God's grace, you would have so much more faith instantly. Look at number five. This is the scriptural reality of the gospel. Jesus prioritized healing. Yes, he did. He preached and he healed. Every person who ever came to Jesus directly received healing. He passed by people that were sick. We know he did that without initiating. But every single person who ever came to Jesus, as far as the scriptural record is concerned, received healing. He never said, now we've developed this theology today. And it sounds good, but he never said, well, it's just not God's timing for you to be healed right now. You know, you're going to have to suffer a little bit more. Or God's really teaching you through this pain and through the suffering. So, you know, maybe in time, but he never said that ever. But yet today we kind of, and I think I'm guilty of this because it's like, you know, I pray for somebody or I expect healing and I don't get it. And my, I never blame myself that it's a lack of faith on my part. <laughs> you know, it's easy to blame others or blame him, you know? So rather than maybe continuing prayer, persevering in prayer, or kind of finding out what the underlying issue is, I think it's really easy for me to just say, to just say, well, I guess it's not God's will um, or to accept something that we don't find in Scripture. And so these are just crystal clear. He healed a lot of people on multiple occasions. He healed all that came to him. Scripture literally says all. It literally says everyone. Sometimes he initiated a healing without being asked. Many times he passed by people without offering to pray and they didn't ask him. So he just passed them by. But every person who ever came to Jesus directly, based upon, just solely based upon the testimony of Scripture, received healing. And Jesus always responded to faith of the person seeking healing or the friends of that person. What's the one town where Jesus did the least amount of miracles and healings? His hometown. His hometown. Because they knew him, they were offended by him. And it says specifically in that context, there was a lack of faith and Jesus could not, he could not do any mighty works because of their lack of faith. So scripture always squarely, remember in the boat when they're about to drown and Jesus, they wake Jesus up and he, he just rebukes the storm instantly and it ceases. He says, guys, he gets on them for their lack of faith. 
It's their lack of faith. So I think there's something to it where oftentimes we're, we're, we're tempted to develop a theology based on our, our failures rather than saying, no, no, no. I've got to change something in my life. Maybe it must be a lack of faith in my life. I've got to rearrange things to align with the word of God because when we look in the word, we see that Jesus' response to faith, it's always an issue of faith. He healed every person who came to him. I've got to press in to figure this out a little bit better. So, um, now, here's the cool thing about Brazil, okay? This is why, see, you guys, we don't get a clear grasp of this, but I'm going to tell you why. If you would have lived back then, you would have had a lot more faith than you do today. And if you were in Brazil with me, you would have had a lot more faith. I'll tell you why. Because imagine you're there with thousands of people, right? And you're standing there watching. And every single person who comes to Jesus is healed. Every single person. You've watched 292 people come to Jesus and all 292 people were healed. And you're 293. Do you believe that Jesus has the power to heal? Certainly. I just watched it. Almost 300 people. Do you believe he's going to heal you? I would. He just healed every single person in front of you. 292 people. He's going to heal you. Right? I mean that. So when you see. The, the, um, the way to increase faith. Remember faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. When we meditate on the word, when we keep our eyes on Jesus, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, not on our failures, not on our weaknesses, not on what other people, not on, just on Jesus. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, our faith will grow, right? And when we look to Jesus and it says, scripture says he healed every human being that came to him. That's all. That increases my faith. When I pray, I'm not, when I pray for somebody, I'm not praying like, God, if it's your will, please heal someone. I am praying because I'm confident. When you've seen Jesus heal every single person who ever came to him, you can have 100% confidence that it's God's will to heal Sonia. So when I pray, I'm praying with 100% confidence. Does that make sense? Now, I might not be praying correctly because I'm trying to cast, I'm trying to heal her elbow when it's really a demon that's trying to cause it. I might need to cast out the demon and she gets better. So praying correctly is a different story. But I think when we get a grasp of the awe in Brazil, I mean, I, the first person I prayed for, I was shocked, honestly shocked. I felt nothing. The person just, I mean, radical deliverance from demonic, physical manifestation, and within seconds, I mean, within 60 seconds, the person's healed. That's so strange. Didn't feel anything. Then I did the next person. Next day, once you get 10 in a row, oh, number 11, I'm like, bring them. Come on. You're, you're going to get it. Whatever. You know what I mean? And once you get to, I only had one person out of like 50 people. And looking back on that, I should have taken a different approach. I really feel like she had arthritis in her fingers and she didn't get any relief from the pain. I sent her to somebody else. Uh, I prayed three times. I'm like, what in the heart? It's so strange. And the Lord later conv convicted me and said it was, he, this is what I felt. So you take it for what it is. Uh, there was unforgiveness in her life. And if she would have forgiven, if I would have pressed this, is there anybody in your life that you need to forgive and let go of that bitterness? It was a spirit of bitterness and unforgiveness. If that spirit would have left, it, her, the pain would have been removed and she would have been, you know, she would have felt better. But I missed it in the moment and I wish I could go back, but I can't. But once you see 40 people in a row, it's so strange. You don't feel anything. You're just praying. You're just being faithful to what scripture says. These people are desperate. They don't really have the medical care that we have, you know, and you just lay your hands on them and you pray as the spirit leads and you see God work. I mean, by Number 41, 42, I'm totally confident. Totally confident. You've just seen 40 out of 40, you know? So I think that's a big deal. Recognize that Jesus healed every person who came to him. He healed thousands. And in many cases, go back and read number two, Matthew 4, Matthew 8, Matthew 9, Matthew 14. Jesus healed every single person. Now, look down a little bit further. This is why Jesus heals people. Um, this message is really not about you. Okay, it's about him and who he is. But I'm going to end with an application question. And it's thinking about these, of these seven reasons of why Jesus healed people. You know, if you're going to go to him, I, honestly, logically, I would just appeal to a several of these reasons. You know, if you're going to go to Jesus and ask for healing, I would appeal to as, number, as many of these reasons as possible. And I don't feel like that's 
manipulative because this is who Jesus is. This is a, th these principles were put into place after studying multiple scriptures. And this is why Jesus did what he did. Number one, Jesus healed to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. We looked at that last week. Isaiah 53 fulfilled in Matthew chapter 8. All right. Uh, Jesus healed to prove that he was the Messiah and to draw people to put their faith in him. We see that on the missions field. Um, I would say even in Brazil, it's probably more. But you know what? America is the second, lar third largest missions field in the world. Okay. Just think about how many people. There are, how many people are here in America? Yeah, well, probably more. I thought it was more like 350. So you got 300 million people that are not, I'm talking not religious. I'm not saying I identify as a Christian. I go to church. I'm Catholic. I'm saying born again. Okay. You got 300 million people that are not born again in a relationship with Jesus. Huge missions field. So we ought to be seeing this here today. I, I don't, but oftentimes you hear, you know, on the fringes. We have this missionary that went to uh, New Guinea, or where, where was it, the islands in the, the pineapple man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like these headhunters, I mean cannibals. And he wasn't particularly seeking miracles, but they all believed in the spiritual realm. And if you don't have power, they're not going to serve your God. Your God's got to be stronger than their God. Because if they cross their God, he's not going to, he's going to curse the women that can't get pregnant. The rain's not going to come down. So this missionary had to show that his God was more powerful than the idols and the demons they serve. And the miracles that he described, <clears throat> and he comes from a very conservative background where it's like, you don't talk about that, you don't believe in that stuff. But God changed his heart on the missions field and Jesus proved to draw people to him. Jesus proved that he was the Messiah through one of the things was miracles and healings on that missions field. So it's evangelistic motivation. All right, number three, Jesus healed to prove his deity and his authority to forgive sins. We looked at that. Um, Melody just asked me a question before service. I forget, was that in Luke chapter 7? John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus, said, are you the right one? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus said this, I've raised the dead, I heal the lepers, I heal the sick, I cast out demons, and I preach the good news. That's the evidence. Take it back to John. I am. I'm he, you know? So Jesus even appealed to uh, the miracles and healings that he was doing as proof that he was the Messiah, that he was God, and that he had the authority um, to, to forgive sins as he was claiming. Number four, Jesus healed to prove the kingdom of heaven had come and that his authority was superior to that of Satan's. I love this verse, 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God came put that down as a reference. The reason the Son of God came uh, was to destroy the works of the devil. That's his purpose. He came to undo the power of sin and the power of Satan. Number five, Jesus healed as a display of God's compassion and loving heart and mercy. And I mentioned that. If he can have mercy on demons, which I don't even know why he allowed them to go into the pigs and I would have just sent them straight to hell. He, he had mercy on his children. Uh, number six, Jesus healed because people asked him to. Remember the passage where it says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Uh, and number seven, that the Father and Son would be glorified. It's all about his glory. So, you know, if I was in your shoes and I was coming before Jesus, I'd say, Jesus, I know you are, you are a God of compassion, full of compassion. And this is for your glory because I'm not just asking for me. If this healing takes place, everybody's going to know about it. It's going to change the dynamic of the whole household. It doesn't mean everybody will believe in you as a result, but it's going to change. Everybody's going to be aware of it. Like Lazarus raising from the dead. Many people believe because they saw Lazarus resurrected from the dead. But remember, the Pharisees continue to reject it. Um, so you can get glorified. You can, when we ask based upon scripture, he's full of compassion. Um, so when we, when we appeal to some of these, these qualities of Jesus, these motivations of Jesus, I think it can improve um, our chances of seeing success. So as we meditate on the word, as we keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, as we study the word, just the word, just the word. I've read of stories. I mean, you guys know in my life, I probably prayed for 2000 people. 
just for healing. And I've had, in Kristen's case, she used to do home care. There was this, uh, I remember this little baby. The little baby was dying. And I fasted for like four or five days, just water. And I arrived there, she was the nurse. The whole family had gathered. I asked the mom permission if I could go into the bed. I knelt down, I was like, if any, I mean, I was, and I was so, I was all prepared. I was gonna stay, the child was gonna raise up out of the bed. I was gonna go out on the front porch, preach the gospel to everybody. Everybody's gonna be so happy. People are gonna get saved. I mean, I had all these motivations. It didn't happen and it should have happened. And I don't blame God. I don't explain it away. The way that I is, and this is the way that uh, when I went to Brazil, the guy that heads this, Randy Clark, it took him 20 something years to see a breakthrough in his own prayer ministry when it comes to like blind eyes or, or crippled, lame. He, he wrote his doctoral uh, thesis on metal in the body. So imagine you had back, back surgery or knee. He had metal in the body. And when you pray, the metal disappears. It's dissolved and the person's healed. So that's provable, right? I mean, you can do x-rays and you can see, or whatever, MRI or whatever it is. So he's seen maybe 25, 30 of those cases. And that's what he wrote his paper, his doctoral thesis on, was that particular type of hearing. But he's described, he says, it took me many years, many, many years to, to get enough faith to pray for this person and see a breakthrough. You know, um, I've, I've heard of stories about like, you know, raising the dead and things. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have an answer for all. All I know is if I keep my eyes on Jesus, it's an issue of faith. It's an issue of holiness. I want to increase in the spiritual realm. The more of his, the word, the more of I have of Jesus in me. When I reach my hand out to pray for somebody, it's Jesus praying for that person. I can have confidence. The more I meditate on my failures or my weaknesses or what happened last time I prayed and it didn't happen and I get discouraged, and it's easy to get discouraged. I think we lose faith, you know? So, was that a question? Or, oh yes, yes. I, okay, yes. Now, thank you, Lisa. I'm on, uh, oh no, this is wonderful. No, 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 this is good, this is good. Listen. Yes, no, it's wonderful. What you're gonna say is absolutely perfect. It's gonna be great. Let me, I'm at the end. I'm at the end. Um, let, me, let me say a few more words and then I want you to share, okay? All right. Um, when I pray for people, I never tell them it's their lack of faith. I always take personal responsibility, always. It has nothing to do with them. It certainly helps if they have faith and I have faith. That certainly helps. The more faith, the better, right? And again, I said, depending on the source of the issue, I think, finally, here's my final point. When we peer into heaven, we see there's no sin and there's no sickness in heaven. And we know God's perfect will is being done in heaven. No sickness, no sin. Now, we know in scripture, God's desire is that all people be saved, but will all people be saved? No. When I look to heaven, I keep my eyes on heaven, I see there's no sin, there's no Satan, there's no sickness. That's my goal, that's my target. But I recognize that we're not gonna eliminate all sin here on earth. We're not gonna eliminate Satan and his influence on earth. And we're not gonna eliminate sickness on earth. I recognize it. There's a disconnect between the God's perfect will in heaven and God's will on earth. I don't have all the answers for why there's a disconnect. All I know is I keep my eyes on heaven and I know, the, I know his will. And I'm gonna pray, every time I pray for you, I'm gonna pray with 100% of my being that we see what is, what, is, what is a reality in heaven manifested on earth. If it doesn't happen, I don't think we should give up. I don't think we should blame the, per I, I don't think we should blame the person we're praying for. Um, sometimes it takes further investigation. Sometimes it takes perseverance and prayer. I don't have all the answers. And I do know that something like this sometimes can really, well, I'm praying for something. I've been praying for something for decades and it hasn't happened yet. So how do you explain that? All right, so we all got things we're praying for. It haven't happened. I can't explain it, I don't know. But I want you to keep your eyes on the word of God and think about the value, the relationship of faith and the works of God 
you know, as we pursue more of him to be able to minister more of his power and presence to others. Miss Lisa. I love all the words that you said and the thing the Lord has put on my heart is the, is he able and is he willing? First of all, like you said, how can we believe 100% doubts of things being answered on earth. I feel like hundred percent God wants everybody to be in heaven. Right? Right. And I feel like the healing with Jesus, like he said, whenever he was directly asked to heal, he healed, but there were people he didn't heal. And Paul never walked with Jesus and spoke to Jesus, but Paul was never healed of the thorn within his side. But the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for you. Because I think of the verse of for God says that all things 